and welcome to the Leading with Lean podcast. My name is Philip Holt, author of Leading with Lean, The Simplicity of Lean, and Leading Lean by Living Lean. And in this podcast, I narrate all three of my books, chapter by chapter, in which I share with you my over 30 years of experience as a lean leader across many companies globally. Leading with Lean, Chapter 12, Coaching Leadership. Hansai. From an early age, Japanese children learn what the Japanese call hansai, a form of self-reflection to understand what went wrong in a given situation and to learn from it. From the first social interactions at kindergarten, when a Japanese child behaves in a way deemed unacceptable to their teacher, they'll be asked to take some hansai time to think about what they've done wrong, then explain their reflections to their teacher and what they might do differently in the future. Whilst it could be argued that children are often asked to think about what you've done in Western society, it's much more common for the child to be told what it is that they've done wrong and how they should adjust their behaviour to conform in the future. This differs from the approach taken with a Japanese school child. The habit of hansai is probably one of the key differences between the Japanese and Western way of thinking. This may go some way toward explaining why problem solving in the form of Deming or PDCA cycle was adopted with such sustainability by a large number of Japanese companies and resonates at every level in the organisation, from practical problem solving at the shop floor level through to Horshin Canary at the board level. This way of reflecting and improving one's performance, effectively personal practice of the check and act parts of the cycle, is central to coaching leadership, the fourth and final leadership style of the lean leader. The lean leader must be able to both practice and teach Hansai in order to garner the level of deep reflection that the lean organisation requires. When the lean leader is able to practice Hansai as a habit, a certain freedom of action is achieved, whereby they feel free to experiment with new approaches and accept challenges without the fear of failure. It is a liberating experience. My personal experience with Hansai started around seven years ago from when I wrote this book when I learned of the practice and decided to experiment with it. To say that it was a personal revolution in my effectiveness is not hyperbole, and I cannot stress enough its importance to a lean leader. Whilst they already had in place some of the habits that make Hansai effective, capturing my daily thoughts and meeting notes both in writing and diagrammatically, the discipline of taking time out of my day to think and reflect on what went well and what didn't, and to critically determine how to improve, was his revelation. The approach that I now take is simultaneously simple and difficult to do. At the end of every day, I have half an hour of Hansai time planned, in which I reflect upon and review the day to determine what went well, what didn't, and, from each, what I learnt and how I can act differently in the future. Whilst that in itself is simple, the difficulty lies in the reality that the most challenging days are those on which it is most difficult to find the time to spend on Hansai, as they are the ones where one feels most compelled to do not more and not to waste time reflecting. Despite this challenge, I have found that by forcing myself to invest the time, I have been able to learn and improve my ways of working. I feel that this has made a great improvement in my personal performance and, ultimately, my articles on LinkedIn and this book have been born out of my Hansai moments. However, despite the importance of developing this Hansai approach, the lean leader's greatest challenge is to establish this practice in others. This is difficult in a traditional organisation as, despite the wildly accepted knowledge of the four situational leadership styles of directive, supporting, coaching and delegating, Leadership is predominantly associated with the directive style. Often the expectation from both the leader and those led is that the solution to a problem will be given by the leader and that the team member will simply follow their instruction and implement it. This approach is addictive as both the leader and the team member gain a certain security. The leader feels like they have done something and the team member's risk level is relatively low. If it works, they will be rewarded and if it doesn't, it wasn't their idea. However, The simple fact is that it creates a culture whereby the team members become dependent on the leader to solve all of the problems and very little is done without the leader's input, decision or direction. This results in only a few of the most urgent, but not necessarily most important, problems being solved, leaving many problems persistently unsolved and hence multiple opportunities untapped. 
It is therefore essential that the lean leader changes the approach with her team members and that of the other leaders in the organisation by taking an approach that encourages the team members to reflect on problems and solve them without being told what to do. Instead, employing their own knowledge, intelligence and experience. Toyota Kata An approach that is prevalent in Toyota and has hence been termed Toyota Kata, as documented by Mike Roffer, works on the basis of Genshi Genbotsu, or going to where the work is done, and is aimed at creating an interaction between the leader and the team member that is based upon mutual respect and the inherent pursuit of creating sustainable solutions and learning for both. The approach is very simple to understand but takes discipline and, for most managers, a change in leadership approach and style as they practice helping their people to find solutions for coaching rather than a directive style of leadership. The lean leader will, as a visible leader, be at the workplace regularly and be interacting with their team members to support their daily management of the operations, whether that be a manufacturing floor, design office or marketing suite and will take the time to understand how the organisation is performing and where problems need to be solved. A great way to do this is to ask questions and, through an approach called Kamishibai, discussed in Chapter 12, the leader can visit their people with meaning rather than to tick a box. The Kamishibai approach is a layered audit of a process or a step thereof and is named after a Japanese storytelling approach that is used with children to tell a story visually. The name was adopted because the approach uses visual cards to determine which process the auditor should check, the questions to be asked and the result. And in the book you would see um, a picture or a representation of what a commission by card rack might look like with Monday through to Friday uh, on the top of the columns and then in each column there is a card um, dictating what you will actually go check. So there might be operations improvements meeting, there might be daily warehouse huddle, etc. The philosophy of the approach is that by doing many of them, but on a small scale, more problems will be solved and increased ownership will be encouraged compared with a traditional audit approach, which typically is larger in scale, uses auditors external to the department and is usually undertaken in the spirit of poacher and gamekeeper. As with all lean thinking, the commission buy is essentially about localised ownership, short interval control, visual management and rapid problem solving. The lean leader will therefore use commission buy to integrate CATA into the organisation and, as it matures, peer as well as leadership commission buy will develop as the team members start to check each other's processes and help each other to improve every day. Of course, the key element in all of this is that trust is developed and that the team members understand and believe that the check is performed on the process and not on them. Whilst the questions asked when employing CATA can be developed by the team members, the best starting point and what has become almost a CATA standard is to ask the following. Number one, what is the target condition? Number two, what is the actual condition now? Number three, which obstacles do you think are preventing you from achieving the target condition now? Number four, what is your next step? What do you expect? And number five, how quickly will we be able to see the outcome of that step? By asking these questions, the lean leader may develop an understanding, along with the team member, of how the process is performing and where problems can be solved. Most importantly, this enables the leader to coach the team members to solve the problems for themselves. When this is undertaken successfully, it will gradually embolden the associates to take the ownership and accountability to do this not only when they are being challenged and coached by the leaders but on a daily basis themselves when they see the problems that they would previously have ignored or just accepted. Of course the CATA approach should not be reserved exclusively for during the commission by activity as it is equally valid during times of problem solving with the team members. However the commission by is a great way of proactively uncovering issues that may remain persistently unresolved due to a perception that they are unimportant to the leadership. In fact, through this activity, leadership activism is demonstrated to the team members and the importance of Kaizen every day, the solving of small problems on a daily basis, is both modelled and reinforced. Hi, Philip here. Sorry to interrupt the narration of this particular chapter, but I just wanted to remind you that all of my personal profits from the books go to charity. And So if you would 
like to buy a book, it would really be helpful. Otherwise, if you feel that the podcast is sufficient, then please feel free to make a donation to my current charity, which is Women's Aid. It's a great charity which helps to stop domestic violence for women and children. Thank you. The final leadership style. The leadership style, coaching leadership, is the fourth and final style required for leading with lean and is integral to the lean leadership approach. To illustrate this, imagine how frustrating it must be as the coach of a football, soccer team, during the game. At worst, they see their carefully drawn up game plan evaporate in front of their very eyes and at best, they may win but have to watch as not everything goes to plan and they rely on the players to make changes to the play as they respond to the actions of the opposition. They can, of course, try to speak to their players whilst they are playing. And it's not unusual to observe coaches who arrived at the game cool and collected, screaming incessantly at their players during the game. However, no matter how much coaches try to influence their players with their cries from the sideline, the crucial point is that they are not on the field of play and the game is played by the players themselves. While the coach may have an overwhelming urge to enter the field of play, they have the advantage of being prohibited by the laws of the game and therefore have no choice but to coach from the sidelines. This is an advantage because if they were allowed to enter the field of play, they may try to do the work for the players, but would inevitably only make things worse and demotivate the team. Relating this back to business, far too often leaders micromanage their team members, entering the field of play and trying to play the game for them. However, ironically, the supposed problem solving is usually not done at the gamba, but in a meeting room or remote office, using online dashboards, discussing perceptions of problems and opinions on solutions, which far too often do not include the insights or expertise of the people who actually do the work. Instead, a new mandate, a set of golden rules or procedures are sent to those who do the work, providing them with the answer, in inverted commas, to a problem they didn't know existed and which doesn't address the root cause of the issues that they face every day. The result is the dichotomy of a system that combines over-intimate management, including firefighting on a daily basis, with remote problem-solving, leading to demotivated and frustrated team members and, at best, average operational performance. As Steve Jobs once said, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We hire smart people so that they can tell us what to do. Learning from the laws of the game of football, and more sports, there is the need to build a system whereby the leaders of the organisation focus their work on setting its vision, mission, values and strategic objectives. Then, by working with their teams, they convert the objectives into goals with clear deliverables that are cascaded throughout the organisation and, through the training and development of their staff, build the overall organisational capability that will support the creation of a high-performance culture. Crucially, they must allow their people to do the work and problem solve without telling them what to do. This is not to say that leaders should be banned from going to the gamba. Quite the contrary, as we want them more than they currently are on average, as discussed in the chapters on the visible and activist leadership styles. But what we need is for them to coach, not try to play the game for their team. This requires a different skill set and mindset than most leaders have developed over their careers, changing the role from the most experienced and expert of the team, or at least thinking that, able to tell everyone how to fix the problems, to a coaching role, asking the right questions to enable the team to solve the problem structurally. Most importantly, they need to allow their people to make mistakes and learn from them, approaching the solution and doing things differently than they would personally prefer. This is a key component of lean leadership. It's the only way that an individual can have the scale of impact that is necessary to drive high business performance, getting results through enabling the skills of others and their engagement in the work, as opposed to by telling them what to do. This requires a leap of faith from the individual leader, facing a perceived loss of control and a fear that performance will go downhill without their explicit intervention and direction. Whilst it is true that if control has been the norm in the organisation or group, then a complete change overnight is not advisable, as the team will not have the requisite organisational capability, the change in behaviour and ways of working has to begin and make significant progress whilst we build the capability and trust of the team. Moving to a coaching leadership style will not be easy. However, it is essential to achieve long-term, sustainable success for the organisation. 
the journey to a coaching style. Earlier in the chapter, I referred to the four situational leadership styles of directive, supporting, coaching, and delegating, and how traditional leadership is predominantly associated with the directive style. The journey to a coaching style therefore depends upon the leadership actively practicing the different styles and managing the change of behaviour in the organisation. This will be difficult, as at every level of the organisation, people will find this difficult for one reason or another, depending on their personal motivations. In the book, what you will see is a picture of the change curve, where on the y-axis we see performance or competence, and on the x-axis we see time. And what we see is the curve as it goes from the status quo into shock, denial, frustration, acceptance, experimentation, understanding, and rising further up to integration. And at the bottom, what I've put in place are the four different styles, showing that in the beginning we will start in a directed mode before moving into coaching, into supporting, and then finally into delegating as we've moved really up that high performance curve. For some leaders, especially middle managers, this will be perceived as a challenge to their raising debt, so as the change in their way of working, actively coaching the team members towards autonomy will provide uncertainty about their role in the organisation. If the teams become autonomous, what is the need for them? For others, it might cause them to question their role as a manager of the group or department, as their passion may actually lie in the technical role itself, what they studied and trained to do, and so a general management role that appears to encourage them to keep out of the technical elements of the job might be unappealing. For some team members, this move to autonomy could be seen as adding responsibility to their role and could be perceived as increasing the risk of the role without visible benefits. As discussed earlier in the book, answering the question, what's in it for me, is especially pertinent for this cohort. Despite these concerns, the truth is that the organisation's journey through the performance and associated change curve will not reduce in a reduced requirement for middle managers, group leaders, area managers and department heads, for example. In fact, there will be an increased need for these leaders of operational excellence, the people who set the vision of success for their people and establish the enablers for their success. The functional expertise will be required more than ever, but they will be required to act as teachers to those less able than themselves, creating a virtuous cycle of learning as the leader learns by teaching. In fact, the power of this is that the team members and the leaders start to build upon each other's ideas and successes as the learning becomes self-perpetuating. For the team members, the fear of autonomy increasing the risk profile of the role is ill-founded as it actually allows them to take far more control of their job and its future direction than they have ever had before, as they gain the opportunity to implement the ideas that they have held for a long time and to solve the problems that cause frustration every day. In fact, for those team, me team members in high-cost countries, the case for cost reduction through the transfer of their work to lower-cost locations or its automation can be challenged and in some cases prevented through the eradication of the waste in the process and the achievement of operational excellence. This is because the case for wage arbitrage reduces when wasteful activity is removed, as the value proposition of the value-added part of the process is often much more focused on the service and quality elements than cost. In the case of automation, once waste has been reduced significantly, the added flexibility of a human being can refocus the organisation towards higher value-added propositions as opposed to efficiency-based approaches. Examples of this have been well documented with Mercedes-Benz and Virgin Money, for example. The journey from the directive style to the coaching style of leadership will not be an easy one, as there are many changes in mindset to affect. However, it is an essential part of leading with lean and, starting with themselves, the lean leader will have to ensure that it is a key part of the change leadership of their organisation's lean transformation. Mm -hmm.